The Teaching of the Master by Brother L. G. Sargent Brother Sargent's book is a consideration of Christ's Discourse on the Mount, as recorded in Matthew chapter 5 to Matthew chapter 7. So let us commence the book. Part 1. The Preparing of the Teacher. Chapter 1. The Word Spoken and the Word Made Flesh. A word is the expression of a mind, and words are a channel through which power is exercised. Originating in the mind of one, that power can flow forth to many who are influenced by a thought or who obey a command. The grand assumption of Scripture is that behind all that men can know, there is an eternal mind whose spirit fills the universe. And when the mind of the eternal is expressed, the power is without limit, and the result instant and infallible. Between the word and the work of God, therefore, the connection is so close that David can treat them as parallel. When a man speaks, the expression of his mind and the accomplishment of his purpose are, as it were, linked only by a thread which may easily snap. With God, the utterance and the end are one. The word that goeth forth out of his mouth shall not return void, but shall accomplish that which he pleases. And thus by the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. The race of mortal men who in due time spread over his earth could only know God as he expressed himself in terms their minds could grasp. His eternal power and divinity they might read writ large in the works of creation. But the way he wished them to live, and his purpose to redeem men from sin and death, and bring many sons unto glory, could be known only by the words he might speak and those words would be in themselves a power working on recipient minds to effect his purpose with them. In many parts and in many ways, therefore, he spoke. But throughout the record in which it is written, its origin is emphasised. It is the word of the Lord. The word came as a power not of themselves to Elijah, to Isaiah, to Jeremiah and all the prophets who spake as they were moved or born by the Holy Spirit. And sometimes so contrary to his human desires that it could be described as the words of God's holiness. So strongly was the word conceived as actively affecting God's will that it could be spoken of as though it were an object going forth from God and functioning as his agent. The word was God-breathed, and as an out-breathing going forth from God, it could be spoken of as though it had taken on an objective existence. Though given in many parts and in many ways, the revelation of God was thought of as a whole but its essential unity was established when all its manifoldness was gathered up in one full and perfect revelation. As the eternal Spirit moved upon the face of the waters in God's creative work, so now the Holy Spirit came upon a virgin of the house of Israel, and the power of the Most High overshadowed her. And the babe who was born in Bethlehem in consequence was called the Son of God. God, therefore, who had spoken through many prophets, at last spoke in one 
and that one a son. But the antecedents of that son went back far beyond the day of his conception, beyond even the first of the prophets or the first angelic message. It is John, the beloved disciple, who shows that the Logos, which combines mind, reason, thought and utterance, had its origin in the beginning and was with God, and was inseparable from his own being. That Logos, says John, became flesh and tabernacled among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. As God had revealed himself in the past through the word spoken through prophets, so now he revealed himself in one who was the living embodiment of his own mind, the brightness of his glory, and the impress of his nature upon human flesh. As with the word which was sent from God, so Jesus could say of himself, I proceeded forth and came from God. Both the word spoken and the word made flesh were expressions of the mind of God through the working of his eternal spirit. For, says Jesus, Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. But so transcendent was this revelation that he could also say, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. Because in this manner the Father was revealed in him, Jesus could speak of himself as not merely true, but the truth. And by the choice of this term, he expressed in a particular way the same principle of the continuity of God's revelation. The rarity of purely abstract terms is one of the distinguishing marks of Hebrew thought. And even where abstract terms appear, in the English version it will often be found that they include in their meaning an active quality which differentiates them sharply from the intellectual abstractions which are so common, for instance, in Greek thought. Truth in the Old Testament is not so much a standard of comparison as a mode of behaviour, and especially is this the case with the truth of God. The work that is in truth, to use an example from the psalm quoted above, is work marked by the steadfastness of God. His truth is his self-consistency, which takes a form of faithfulness in his dealings with men. The living God, therefore, is himself the standard of truth, and this quality is the ground of man's dependence upon God. That which may be depended upon is the idea radically suggested by the Hebrew words. So Jacob could say, I am not worthy of all the truth which thou hast showed to thy servant, when by it he meant the quality of God as revealed in his actions. So Micah could say, Thou wilt perform the truth to Jacob. This idea of truth as essentially active explains the remarkable frequency with which it is joined with mercy throughout the Old Testament. By the example of God, moreover, his children are required to walk in truth, an idea carried over into the New Testament and particularly notable in the writings of John. In Christ we see the full revelation of God's word, the perfect expression of his active truth. Not only does Christ speak truth, he is truth. He is the word which with unfailing power is accomplishing God's ends. And so in the last vision, when he is seen going forth with the heavenly armies to subdue all the world to righteousness, he is called faithful and true, and his name is called the Word of God. How then does Christ himself regard the earlier writing? 
The final answer, as of so much else in Jesus, is the cross. Because it was written in Moses, the Psalms and the prophets, it was binding upon him to suffer. Because he came to do the will of God, he took upon himself all that was prescribed to him in the role of the book, and was obedient even to death, and that the agonizing and shameful death of the cross. We have also his many express declarations of the authority of Scripture, and one such saying must be carefully considered in a study of the Sermon on the Mount. Conviction in such a field, however, is shown most fully and deeply by intimate knowledge and the assurance with which Scripture is used. And in a sense this is true even of the Son of Man. One special aim of the present study, therefore, has been to examine the use of the Old Testament in the Sermon. Many terms Jesus uses had gained a wealth of meaning as they passed through the hands of prophets and psalmists. In many the content had been wrought out in the experiences of Israel's history. It can be shown that this fullness of meaning is carried forward by Jesus into his own revelation. The New Testament words can be followed back to their Hebrew originals, through the Greek version of the Old Testament, a work in which a writer who can lay no claim to scholarship must depend on concordances, commentaries, and such like scholarly aids. The words can then be examined in their various contexts and their development and associations traced. In following a word's growth, aid may sometimes be found in later and uninspired writings, such as the Apocrypha, while rabbinical writings may show the idea which the term would be likely to suggest to a Jewish audience in the time of Christ. It is from this point of view alone that these are occasionally referred to by way of illustration. The tracking to their origins of parables, figures of speech, turns of phrase, will show how thoroughly the mind of the man Christ Jesus was steeped in holy writ. This study of the sermon, therefore, becomes to some extent a study in literary sources, but with infinitely more than a literary significance. The purpose of the sermon is to show the children of the Heavenly Father how they may walk in truth, but they can only be shown the road they are to go if there is clear perception of the end they are to reach. Teaching on the conduct of life must be founded on judgment, explicit or implied, as to the nature, meaning and ends of life. And in that respect, no teaching in Scripture or out of it rests more firmly on its foundations than the Sermon on the Mount. The words of Jesus are marked by all the sublime assurance concerning God, man, life, death, judgment, the kingdom of God, and immortality, which might be expected from one in whom God's truth is embodied. And any study of the Sermon, to be adequate or even reasonable, must therefore be largely a theological study. All great literature has form, and one of the tests of greatness is that the form is not arbitrarily imposed upon the substance, but is itself a part of the meaning. The full quality of the thought can only be conveyed in such a mould. There is no reason to suppose that the form will be any less fitting when the words are those of the Holy Spirit instead of human genius. Now the sermon has definite form. In fine oratory, where clear thinking is matched by emotional power, the sentences tend to fall into balanced and rhythmic clauses, and in Hebrew this tendency is heightened into a poetic technique. 
the regularity and recurrence which distinguish poetry from prose are to be found in the sense more than in the sound. On this principle there were developed the varied and sometimes intricate parallelisms of Old Testament poetry. And translation, probably even double translation from Aramaic to Greek and Greek to English, does not conceal the employment of the same forms in the sermon. To aid the reader in appreciating the structure, at the head of a chapter will be found the passage to which it relates, set out in lines and indented, so that the eye can readily pick out the lines which correspond with one another, and showing also the grouping of lines into stanzas or strophes, which often have a well-marked climax. Added to parallelism, Hebrew poetry, in the view of present-day scholars, shows regularity in the number of accents to the line, in this resembling the early English alliterative verse as distinct from the more sophisticated metrical verse from Chaucer onwards. The lines fall into patterns suited to the mood and subject matter of the poem. It can hardly be mere coincidence that when the sermon is rendered back from Greek into Aramaic, it frequently reveals the same verse forms that are used in the Old Testament. While translation back into the original tongue must be largely conjectural, and we cannot assume that by this means we recover Christ's own words, the fact that these forms come to light in different parts of the sermon does suggest that they must have been present in the spoken word. The sermon is a poem, and it should be read as a poem. Chapter 2 Growth in Wisdom The preacher of the Sermon on the Mount had lived in a Jewish town through a boyhood which was normal in all its outward circumstances. He had been subject to his mother and his presumed father. He had grown through babyhood, boyhood and youth, developing mentally as he increased in stature. In the eyes of those around him he was unique only in the increase of wisdom which accompanied his advance in years, and in the grace of character which won the favour of God and man. But that wisdom is clearly said to have been a thing of growth. It fed on the education in the word of God which a Jewish child received, and we may imagine how well it was nurtured from the time the child could speak, by Joseph and by that handmaid of the Lord who had been chosen to be blessed above women for so precious a trust. Growth mentally and physically was an essential part of his experience in bearing our nature. Nazareth, to which the family had been led, had its own part to play in the training of the teacher. From the ridge of the hill under which the town lay, the boy Jesus could gaze for thirty miles in three directions, over country which has been described as a living map of the history of his people. Prominently before him was the cone of Mount Tabor, where Barak had gathered his forces for the overthrow of Sisera. So let all thine enemies perish, O Lord, but let them that love him be as the sun when he goeth forth in his might. In the valley of Jezreel to the south, Gideon began his pursuit of the Midianites after his army had been reduced deliberately at the stream from the well of Harod, from thirty-two thousand to a mere skirmishing party of three hundred, in order that Israel should not say, Mine own hand hath saved me. Bounding the view beyond were the mountains of Gilboa, scene of the defeat of Saul. To a mind filled with the history of Israel, 
Those heights would call up the whole tragedy of the king, who became haunted by the knowledge of his own rejection, and filled with hatred of the successor whom God had chosen. It was the story of a man who, by worldly standards, was not irreligious, but who was lacking in the faith which could make the word of God a living reality in his life. Weakness in trust has in him its retribution. The ground of trust is removed, and as a result rebellion against the divine judgment finds an outlet in the murderous pursuit of David, and stubbornness leads at last to the seeking of consolation in the witchcraft which stands in antithesis to the God who has forsaken him. In beautiful contrast to Saul was the forefather of the Lord, whose faith was as true as a sheep's in its shepherd, and who, in spite of one great sin, remained in his contrition the man after God's own heart. David is the most profoundly God-conscious man in the Old Testament. Jezreel, beyond the hill Moreh, which divides the two arms of the valley as they descend to the Jordan, was the scene of the downfall of Ahab. That king was the type of the double-minded man, unstable in all his ways, who yielded to the single-minded pride of Jezebel. Looking down on the plain of Esdraelon, Jesus would recall when even the fertile soil watered by the Kishon and its streams had been as iron and the sky over it as brass. Through that plain king, prophet, and the attendants of Baal journeyed to Carmel to decide the great issue. How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. An echo of that challenge was to be found later in Jesus' own words on that other mount. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. From her palace in Jezreel, Ahab's queen sent the threat which drove Elijah to exile in the hills of the Negeb. And there, under the slender shelter of a broom, he was fed with a cake, bacon on the coals. When Jesus hungered after forty days fasting, he would not forget that angelic ministration to Elijah, which for the time was withheld from himself. And while as a youth he looked across to the hills of Samaria, his mind would travel with the prophet far beyond Beersheba to Horeb, the Mount of God. For him once again the strong wind would break in pieces the rocks, the earthquake heave and the fire rage, and when the still small voice would command the prophet to embark on a new mission, with the assurance that even in Israel there was a remnant of seven thousand in whom the word of the Lord dwelt. The purpose of the kingdom had not perished, in small things and among humble folk its seed would grow secretly, bringing forth fruit for the harvest of God's glory. For the day would come when the proclamation should go forth, The Lord reigneth. Sheltering to the south of Mora was Shunem, where a godly woman had made provision for the man of God. In that home, as to Sarah of old, a son was born, a child was given, a witness to the power of God over life and begettal, a foreshadowing in some degree of the purpose to be fulfilled with a virgin in Bethlehem. Did that son think of these things as he looked from the hill above Nazareth? But the child in Shunem died, and again the power of God was shown, this time in a foretaste of that day when death shall be swallowed up in victory. Did Jesus know then that he too would bring joy by raising the dead? 
when in him the kingdom drew near, and that in the end the power of resurrection to eternal life would be in his hands. With such memories and visions we may imagine him looking down on the plain of Israelon, growing in wisdom as he garnered the lessons of God's working in Israel of old. We, in our feebler way, may gather a few of those lessons even in the glance at Israel's history which we have taken. The reality of God, the certainty of his victory in the earth, his power to save by many or by few, and the glory that must be to him alone, his rejection of those whose ears are not open to his word, his choice of those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, and his forgiveness, even when they grievously fail, his claim to the whole of man's heart, and his repudiation of a divided allegiance, his care for those who love him, even when he leads them through the wilderness, his power to work unseen through the poor and the few, his power to accomplish his purpose through a root out of a dry ground, and to bring life from death, and as a corollary to this last, the assurance that man cannot destroy the life, and the awe that belongs to him who can. As Draylon and its surrounding hills summarized in their history the controversy between God and fallen man, and foreshadowed the triumph of the righteousness of God through the seed of David and in his saints. In the divine provision it was no mere chance that the rich significance of the scene could enter into the soul of the growing lad in Nazareth. One of the delights of the sermon is the variety and abundance of its allusions to everyday life. The situation of Nazareth, as well as the periodic visits to Jerusalem from his twelfth year onward, had contributed to this side of Jesus' growth in wisdom. Between Tabor and the hill on which Nazareth stood, the great highway from Damascus emerged onto the plain and crossed to the southern hills. By this route men had travelled to Egypt since the days of Abraham. From the northern edge of the hill could be seen the highway between Acre and the Decapolis along which Roman legions marched, and Roman officials made their way. From the fords of the Jordan Arab caravans journeyed across the Estrelon. Sir George Adam Smith says, it was up and down these roads that the immortal figures of the parables passed. By then came the merchantmen seeking goodly pearls, the king departing to receive his kingdom, the friend on a journey, the householder arriving suddenly upon his servants, the prodigal son coming back from the far country. Galilee was fertile, thickly populated, and with an abundant and busy life. It would have been thriving but for the burden of taxation and political uncertainty. Much of its traffic and many of its companies of pilgrims going up for the feasts passed over the plain from the foot of the hill from which Jesus could look down. Add to these scenes the experience of an oriental town, no mere village, with all its chaffering business and cross-currents of passion and rumour. Add the daily toil in the home of a craftsman, a worker in wood who would also be a builder in a small way. From all these and much more, Jesus drew his knowledge of human life and the range of his illustrations. In the sermon alone he has references to the home, light, salt, the lamp on its stand, the bushel measure, the kinds of food a child might ask for and a father give, to working life, the requirements of a good building, dangers to the flock, minor accidents such as getting a speck in the eye, 
to the customs of the marketplace, the haggling with vociferous oaths, the corn measure well or scantily filled, to social customs and conditions, salutation, public and demonstrative alms-giving, prayer or fasting, the use of abusive epithets in anger at the insulting blow, the habit of storing wealth in perishable forms, to legal procedure, the local council, the Sanhedrin, the plaintiff, the judge, the court officer, the prison, the exacting of pledges, the demand for state service, to nature, birds, flowers, sun and rain, trees good or worthless, the habits of dogs or swine, to familiar scenes, the city on the hill, the beaten track to the main gate and the obscure door in the wall. He had observed them all, and knew how to use them to make his words live.